Coming up, a first-person account from a local journalist who just spent two weeks in the eye of the Jasmine Harton media storm. You're listening to Brent's Two Cents, the semi-serious thoughts of a guy in Belize. And now here's the host of this podcast from somewhere in Belize City, Brent Toombs. Hey, welcome to the podcast for the week of June the 14th. Well, the big story for much of last week, both in Belize and the United Kingdom, continued to be the shooting death of police superintendent Henry Jamat and the charges for manslaughter by negligence against Canadian national Jasmine Harton, who is, of course, the daughter-in-law of Lord Michael Ashcroft, arguably the most powerful man in Belize. Harton was initially denied bail when she was arraigned at Magistrate's Court in San Pedro on May 31st, but after cooling her wealthy and well-connected heels on remand at Her Majesty's Central Prison for eight nights, Harton was finally granted bail by the Supreme Court Justice Herbert Lord last Wednesday afternoon. Now, if you listened to last week's episode of Brent's Two Cents, not only did I predict that Harton would get bail, but I gave you the primary reason why the court would agree that she was not a flight risk. Essentially, because the charge she got for killing a cop is so minor that she would be an idiot to skip bail and become an international fugitive rather than just accept what will most likely be a slap on the wrist. And that's if the case against her isn't dropped completely due to some screw-up by the police or prosecutors. But for now, Jasmine Harton remains on bail of $30,000 plus a surety of the same amount, and she does have a few extraordinary conditions imposed on her freedom, such as a requirement to report to the police station in San Ignacio every day, and a curfew from 7 p.m. until 6 a.m. daily. For the local media in Belize, that's probably a wrap on the Jasmine Harton case until, or if, her trial begins. But not so much for the British press, especially the infamous British tabloids. Thanks to her relationship to Lord Michael Ashcroft, Jasmine Harton continues to be front page news on the other side of the pond. Which means the international spotlight continues to be on Belize and how this case is being managed, or possibly mismanaged, is going to be heavily scrutinized. And that's what I want to talk about this week. But instead of the usual format of me just ranting alone about whatever is on my mind, I've decided to switch things up a bit, and invite a guest to share her two cents about the Jasmine Harton saga. Sharice Halsell is a reporter and anchor for Channel 7 News, and she has been closely covering the Harton story, not just for the Belize audience, but she's also been contributing to stories in the British media. Sharice, thank you so much for taking time out of your weekend to join me on this podcast. I'm sure after the past couple of weeks, you could really use some rest. Thanks for having me, Brent. No, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, and I think I'll be a little bit glad for it to kind of not be so much of a live action film for the next few weeks. (laughs) So my first question for you is, what was it like to be part of that media circus? So it was kind of unlike anything that I'd ever been involved in before, because I'd been out to San Pedro the previous Friday uh, when we went out and we did what we do, an initial package on a murder story. But over the weekend, I hear you're flying right back out there on Monday morning. And that's when things begin to shift so i mean i get up there to the magistrate's court and there's the usual suspects the reporters from love fm channel 5 uh breaking belize news but you start looking around and there's also these foreign reporters who are pretty lost don't know where they are what's going on and so a few of us start talking to some of them and they quickly kind of pick their allegiances and you see them lining up with one Belizean media host or, or other. Um, but it's challenging for them because the, they learn a few things right off the bat, being that one, okay, the Channel 5 reporter clearly works for a channel that's owned by Ashcroft. Um, and then I think with me, they realize that Channel 7 tends to have some of the best sources 
And so that's why I got to contribute a lot of information to them about what was happening or, you know, what was about to happen. So let's talk about the the first 72 hours uh, of the, I guess, investigation, if you can call it that. Uh, but let's talk about that sort of the first 72, 72 hours. And I sort of said this last week on my podcast that it certainly looked to me like there was a some sort of collusion between the police, uh, Harton's attorneys, and and possibly even the DPP to find some way to charge Harton with a bailable offense, you know, um, like manslaughter by negligence. And why I, why I feel so strongly about this is like one of the very first things that Commissioner Williams said uh, on the day after the the day after the shooting was we're not going to do a, a gunshot residue test on Jasmine Harton because, you know, those things are sometimes inconclusive. So we're just not going to bother. Yeah. No, he said that they're almost always inconclusive and that when the feds themselves had come down here to give the Belizean police a course, they basically said, you know, we have problems lifting fingerprints and things like that. So you guys with far inferior technology certainly shouldn't bother, which was interesting to say the least. Yeah, I mean, what's the worst thing that would happen? I mean, it, it, okay, so there's no gunshot residue, so that you know maybe opens the door that she didn't fire the gun. But she, in this case, she's she's admitted to it. But but even before she got to the point of telling the police, okay, here's my version of events. You know, I'm admitting that I accidentally shot my friend. They were like, well, we're not even going to test you. You know, and so you wonder what what else did they not test? You know, that would have been been normally done you know, in the, in the course of a homicide investigation. So it was a really bad look, I think, for the police. And, and I think that's the reason why, not just myself, but I mean, the, I think, you know, if you were to do a straw poll in Belize, I think the majority of people think that the police are not trying to solve this case. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because if you listen to the testimony of Gene Lopez, who is, I mean, San Pedro is such a small place. He's both the bar owner of a bar that Jasmine Harton would frequent once or twice a month, and the security guard was in charge of Matarak, so in fact the first person on the scene. And one of the things he admits is that his security company secured the gun before the police had even got there. And so you know, the police aren't actually the ones that move the gun off the pier. It's the security company that, I don't know what he means by secures it for the police. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it could have been, well, we just put somebody there to watch it that it didn't get touched or moved. I mean, or... Let's hope. Yeah, let's hope. Because what I'm afraid is that we're going to find out, you know, if this ever gets to trial is that, oh, yeah, you know, uh, this security guard or whatever removed the the gun, you know, thinking he was doing the right thing for the police. And well, now the evidence has been, you know, tarnished. And so we can't even, you know, say that this, you know, gun wasn't in somebody else's possession, you know, before the before the police got there. Uh, and, and that's what I'm worried about is that there's going to be some sort of sloppy police work or some sort of, you know, as I say, you know, an I that didn't get dotted, a T that didn't get crossed and, and a shrewd lawyer, you know, Dickie Bradley or one of those guys who will probably end up taking over this case from Godfrey Smith. Um, cause I don't believe Godfrey is a criminal defense attorney. Um, so one of these lawyers that ends up inheriting this case is going to find that, that loophole and, and, and we could see this whole this whole case just thrown out of court. But but before we get there, I'm curious about about the fact that there were no other charges brought against her. I mean, we had a situation, I think, last, just last week where there was a, a road traffic accident and the person was charged with manslaughter by negligence and a whole litany of other charges, as usually happens in any kind of these sort of, you know, accidental deaths or unintentional deaths. Jasmine Harton got one single charge of manslaughter by negligence against her. Don't you find that a little bit a little bit peculiar? Well, I'll tell you right off the bat that I haven't really had a lot of experience doing court cases. I'm t- I tend to be like the murderer on the ground girl, and that's what I go out and I deal with. And then my colleague, Danielle, he takes over when it comes to the court stuff. But So I did ask that question. And what my news editor said to me is that what tends to happen is that you'll get the charge for what is the highest charge and those other smaller charges will kind of melt away. And so that's how I kind of rationalized it for myself and explained it to others. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't usually see a, a judge or jury returning a verdict of like, you know, guilty for like 
11 different charges. It's usually the one big one. But for whatever reason, whether it's just to have enough, to, you know, to hold a person or in case, you know, something falls through, you have something else to fall back on. There's usually a number of other charges associated with like the obvious one would be, you know, possession of a firearm without uh, a license. Which the prosecution kind of argued for um, when they said that, you know, she didn't have a gun license. Why was she even handling this? But then Smith comes back with, well, a lot of this. He, and he didn't want to say it's Jemot's fault, but he did say it's Jemot's fault because this is an officer who's experienced, who shouldn't allow a civilian to handle a gun that he even asked the question, should the officer have had his assigned weapon with him if he was off duty? All these things to say that Jemot had a large amount of responsibility in what ended up happening on that pier. All right, well, let's go back uh, a little bit. I want to talk a little bit with you about this, you know, experience of working side by side with, with the foreign journalists um, and, you know, the, the media circus that was, you know, in San Pedro and then, you know, moved over to Belize City for the, for the bail hearing. Um, what did you notice about maybe just the, you know, the differences in how, say, the British press, you know, uh, attack a story like this, you know, compared to the, the local media? So let's go back to that first day in San Pedro because, what happens is, and I remember clearly, I left the upstairs, which is a magistrate's court, because I had heard about someone who was on the fishing boat with Jemot the day before. And so my instincts as a reporter, I want to go find this person and ask her what that day was like, what the atmosphere was like before anything got started. So I went downstairs to make that phone call. And she did talk to me, but it wasn't a situation where she'd go on the record with anything. But while I'm downstairs trying to make that contact... All of my colleagues from upstairs, Channel 5, Love FM, the Daily Mail, everybody, they get kicked out by the police. So when I get back, all of the local media is sitting on the back step of the magistrate's court. But the Daily Mail guy, he has sneaked back in because the police tell us to leave. We're not going to question their authority anymore. But he's gone back in there. He's talking to the clerk of the court and he's asking questions about, wait, hold on, why can't I be in here? And is there anything in the law to, says that, to say that I can't be in here? And it's this spirit to push for journalistic freedom and the fact that, hey, you can't tell me I don't belong here without a good reason that a lot of us are way too complacent about. Um, I don't know if it's, it comes from being raised by civil servants, as most of us are, but we just don't push authority, and that has to change. But, I mean, in, in his case, the worst thing that would have happened to him is that he might have been arrested, thrown in the piss house, and now he'd be sitting in a cell next to Jasmine Harton. What? He would have had an exclusive interview. <laughs> and I actually thought about that when I was like, following the coverage. It's like, you know, one of these reporters should get themselves arrested on some minor charge to be put in the piss house, you know, and they're going to have an opportunity to have a have an interview, an exclusive interview with Jasmine Harton. Kind of like, uh, I guess, the guy's name was Jose. I believe you did the interview, right? So this is exactly what we were talking about. And I, I mean, it occurred to me too, to even try to do that. But then what was what was discussed was like, but they'll take your phone and then you won't be able to get it out regardless of what you're learning. So. Unless you've got a very good memory, but yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think the difference between us and the international media didn't really come out that day. But then again, it did because, uh, at the end of that first day, the bail hearing doesn't come to fruition. And so channel five and love FM's reporters decide to leave the Island. And I had a choice. I could leave or I could stay because by that time I was already working for the times of London. Um, and so I asked my news editor here at Channel 7 if I should stay. Um, and he, so he was kind of debating cost-wise, like, is it a good decision for her to stay at this point? And I, I say to him, well, you know, the English newspaper could pay for it. And then he starts warming up to, to, to the idea. And those guys left. And so the next day, it's just us, the international press, and Belize Breaking News who... They put their reporter in a far uh, cheaper accommodation, but they still had him stay. Um, and the thing is, we were the ones that got that shot, that shot of her leaving the piss house to get onto the golf cart. And that was a, the shot that was seen around the world. And most of the Belizean media weren't there to capture it. 
And I think they had to settle for a very shaky video that some Sampejo newspaper sent for them. Um, so again, that push and that drive to stay with a story, where it was seen more evidently now, and I got to talk a little bit badly about my channel here too, was in the last few days uh, when she gets bail. Godfrey Smith says to us, well, we ask, is she going to get bail today? And he says, if you guys let me get out of here and finish the paperwork, she might. So at that point, we know she's very likely going to get released today. But what happens? What happens for me is I'm on other stories, which was so contrary to all my instincts. And I said this to my news reporter, to my news editor, why am I on anything else but Jasmine Harton today? That was the situation. Love FM's young reporter, Vijay Alvarez, I don't know if he, this was his initiative or if Renee sent him out there. He was at the prison waiting for her to come out along with the international media, Daily Mail and The Sun. So they all got the shot. And at that point, we're like, damn, but what would have been common sense? It would have been to run to the prison and wait for that shot. And it's something that we didn't do. And we didn't do it again the next day in San Ignacio when we knew that she had to report to that police station. But who was there once again? The male and the son. We got to drive for these shots. And if we're with a story, we got to stay with a story. But it believes it, it, it's always the resources that determine what we can and can't do. Yeah, nothing's changed. I mean, it's been well, over 15 years since I worked in a newsroom in Belize. But we always had, and this was always one of my pet peeves, is we always had multiple stories. And it didn't matter how big one of those stories was, you still always had two or three tacked on to, to your assignment for the day that you had, that you had to, to deliver, you know, for, for six, well, six 30 back then, six o'clock now. Um, so I, I completely get what, you're, what you're, you're talking about. He's like, like, this is the biggest story in Belize. And I mean, I, I don't want to say it's the biggest story ever, but it's certainly in terms of the hype and the excitement and the international attention and everything. This was kind of like what I would almost say, like was Belize's OJ Simpson, moment you know um instead of you know instead of a white bronco it's a it's a golf cart um but yeah you're right i mean that that should have been the only thing on your plate you know that day but speaking of the media houses and it's you know it's no secret that one of the leading media houses in this in this country is owned by lord michael ashcroft and i mean I, as much sympathy as I have for Jules for lack of resources, I have a lot of sympathy for Carla Huesner, who's a good friend and a big supporter of this podcast as news director and, and recently took on that job when you know, she did it years ago, actually when she was news director when I worked at channel five and then she went away and blah, 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 but she's back and talk about terrible timing <laughs> that you go back to channel five as the news director. And then six weeks later, your owner's daughter-in-law uh, shoots a cop. <laughs> And, and you have to try to cover this story, but at the same time, not piss off your owner. And the one, I mean, the one thing I did notice in their reporting, um, and, and I'm disappointed in them for this, is the fact that they did seem to go out of their way to try to avoid saying the name Ashcroft, especially on that first day when the story broke. It was already out on every media outlet that this was Jasmine Hart. In fact, they were calling her Jasmine Ashcroft at that time. A lot of people didn't even realize that it was a common law relationship and that she used the name Harton. Dwayne Moody's report that night still said a prominent San Pedro woman, you know, and it's like, come on, guys, everybody knows who it is. It doesn't look good on you to be trying to hide the identity. It's not going to help her or anything, but obviously those decisions were probably made by Ashcroft himself and you know hey the boss is always right but anyways I don't want to beat up on, on channel 5 and it definitely is not appropriate for me to ask you to comment on that but I do want to know did you notice you know all the other media houses who aren't owned by Ashcroft whether there was a sort of a, a specter of influence by Lord Ashcroft over how local media were handling the story because he is still a very very powerful person in this country and, and he doesn't have to own your media house to have an impact on your bottom line. I mean, Belize Bank is one of the largest advertisers in this country. So, and he's also somebody who is not shy about hauling people into court to litigate them into submission. So was there a sense of trepidation amongst the the media core of like, oh man, I got to be careful how I, how I cover this story because I don't want to piss off Ashcroft? I'm going to say no. 
And I don't want to belabor the point of Channel 5, but that, that second morning when we're all waiting in the court, there's no Channel 5 reporter there until about 10. And when Dwayne walked in, I was surprised to see him because in my mind I was like, is he even going to come back today? But he did. Um, but for the rest of them, Breaking Belize News, uh, Love FM, and I think Krem was the only one that was not out there. Um... I'm going to say no. I think everybody was driving for the story to just kind of make it as good a story as they could and as interesting as they could, and everybody wanted all the facts. And like I told you, Breaking Belize News stayed, and they made sure that they got the shot as well. So I, even if there was trepidation on, on these people's part because of their bottom lines, it wasn't reflected in their reporting. So you didn't, you didn't get a sense that the people were getting text messages or anything like that saying, you know, like, uh, prefer you don't mention this or I didn't like the way that, you know, that particular photo from her Facebook page made her look or, you know, no, I'm, I'm gonna say no. I know that later on, uh, the daily mail, you know, they faced some issues from Ashcroft, some litigation, they are facing litigation from Ashcroft right now. Um, for things that are as simple as the the photo of her behind bars, um, which they're saying is completely against, I guess, against the law for them to have acquired and for them to put out there. It's, it's against her right to privacy, if anything. So I know that they're facing litigation about that. But again, for all the other Belizean media channels that weren't Channel 5... Everybody was just driving as hard for the story as I was. How difficult is it? Uh, I mean, you've been a television reporter for about, about two years now, I think. Almost. Almost two years, right? So, I mean, you're, you're, you're fairly, fairly new to this, um, this, this industry. But how difficult it, is it for you covering a story like this where there are particular details that you become aware of? I mean, you and I have talked off the record about certain things that we've, you know, that we've heard, but, you know, you can't say them not as not as a responsible journalist or even a just as a podcaster who doesn't want to get his ass dragged into court <laughs> there's certain things that you can't say but how frustrating is that um for you to to see that there may be a lot more to the, there's a lot more to this story than will ever come out in court that will ever come out you know in public and and not be able to pursue it or not even know if it's something that you should should try to pursue. It's pretty frustrating because it you're forever a dog chasing a bone and it's right there and you can taste it. And it's not whether or not you should pursue it. You are, well, at least in my case, I continue to actively pursue it. But unless I can get someone to go on the record, and I mean even an off camera on the record, whatever I may know or whatever I may have heard, it just becomes smoke. Yeah. And then our liable laws in Belize are structured in a way that even if some, just because someone gives you an interview and, and they want to stand behind their story, doesn't let you off the hook. If somebody gives you an interview and lies about what happened and, 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 and says, you know, well, she did this or he did that or whatever. And it's, and it's not true. You know, you're, you're still on the hook for liable. I think the British press probably has a little more latitude with that where they, they can probably, you know, as long as they've got a source and they can say, listen, no, uh, you know, we've, we've vetted the source. We, we, we have every reason to believe the source is telling us the truth. I think they can publish a lot more stuff in their media than, than we ever could. And I faced that with that initial interview I did with the man who was in the cell block next to her, the, the guy we referred to as Jose in that interview. Um, I'm one of the reporters that I'll go back and I'll read the comments on whatever my story is for that day. And there were a few interesting ones. Somebody was like, this dude just been one too bad, man. And, you know, he saw the opportunity. But we got a sense from this guy and based on other things that we knew were, were happening, that a lot of the things that he said to us, um, they were coherent and they were, what's the word? They were in line with a lot of other things that we knew to be true. And even so later on, when more things began to be unearthed, then what he had said to us became even more clear to say, yeah, that those were the series of events that happened that night, that, that initial 48 hours when she got into the cell. So how do you see this case ultimately concluding? Like, Will there be justice for Superintendent Henry Jamat? 
I mean, it, it depends on what you'd view as justice based on what, and I, like you keep saying, it all goes back to the charge that was preferred. Will there be justice for manslaughter by negligence? I believe so. But what does that mean? Does it mean that she's just going to pay a fine? I think so. And I think just as most Belizeans were not surprised to see this prominent, well-connected woman get bail, which I mean, everybody gets bail for manslaughter by negligence, but we'll be even less surprised, and this is just my projection of what's going to happen, to see her ultimately be able to pay this family what I imagine will be a good sum of money. But how is that justice for a life lost? How is that justice for a father taken away from five young children? And I, I was at the funeral yesterday and I saw his only son really just broken up and turning into his mother's shoulder to cry. And I just keep thinking, wow, like there really isn't anything that can replace a father in a child's life. Yeah, I agree. I I mean, I do think there will be some sort of civil settlement and that will happen before this gets to trial because, you know, it looks good if you go in and say, well, you know, your honor, you know, we've already given the family $50,000 or whatever it's going to be. So, you know, we've, we've made restitution that way. And, you know, um, but I'm not sure that this case will ever get to trial. You know, I think that, you know, a shrewd lawyer is going to find a technicality to get this case dismissed. And it sort of hit me over the weekend. The, what I think is going to be the, the, the linchpin or you know, the, the key that, you know, sets Jasmine Hart and free and all this. And I, I think it's got something to do with this cocaine possession, this 0.4 grams of cocaine. And, and the reason why, you know, I sort of had this, this epiphany about it is that it was reported last week, um, when you know before before the charges were were ultimately laid against her that it was the cops threatening her with um charging her with cocaine possession that she ultimately began to cooperate now i don't know if that's true or not but that was the narrative that was put out and i'm wondering if that wasn't deliberately put out there to to sort of set the table that she was coerced into giving the caution statement that the police wanted her to give, you know, um, and that that might be there to say, listen, you know what? Um, when she said she accidentally shot him and stuff, that's not really how it went down, but that's what the cops wanted to hear. And they were threatening her with this cocaine possession charge. If she didn't say what they wanted her to say. And, and anyways, I, that I think might be, you know what it is. I might be completely out in left field about that, but just something about that, that 0.4 grams of cocaine just does, it just never really sat well with me. Um, you know, how that fits into this whole sordid tale of, of what went down. So that's interesting. And we did initially report that, you know, that was on the table for her to be preferred with that lesser charge. And it's also interesting because of two separate interviews that Chester did. One with Jules Vasquez, where Jules asks him about that cocaine charge and whether or not we'll hear about that again, if that's going to come back. And he said, yes, certainly something we're going to look into. And then he did another interview with Fox News, where they asked him the very same question. And he said, no, there's not going to be any cocaine charge. Why such different answers to local and foreign media? Yeah, it it just seemed to me there was was too much emphasis placed on 0.4 0.4 grams of cocaine and how that was playing into her uh, suddenly willingness to, to cooperate. Cause I don't think there's anything odd about her saying, listen, I'm not going to say anything until my lawyer gets here. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure she's smart enough to know that, you know, that she shouldn't be admitting to shooting somebody until she has an attorney there to make sure she doesn't, you know, say something that's going to, that's going to harm her, you know, her, her situation. So I didn't, I didn't really take it to, okay, well, she's not, she's not cooperating. Oh, that must mean she's guilty of something terrible. I just think that when they said, okay, well, you know, once they put this, you know, dangled this cocaine charge in front of her that she's like, okay, okay, I'll talk. That doesn't make sense to me, you know? Um, And I just, I don't know, just something, just something about that. So anyways, that's 
this weekend I was just thinking about the case and I was like, I wonder if that's going to be what it, you know, what Dickey or Oscar Sabido or one of those guys uses to, to ultimately get this thing thrown out of court, which is what I, which is what I think will happen. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I don't think this will ever make it to trial. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think that's going to be a, it's going to be a tragedy, even if it does, you know, as, as we were talking about, she's going to be tried for manslaughter by negligence and everything else that may have happened, that may have resulted in Jamat getting shot is never going to come to light. Um, but I don't think it's as simple as the story she's, she's told the police. No, I don't think so either. Well, that seems like a really uh, uh, pessimistic <laughs> point to wrap up this interview. <laughs> it, it's kind of it's kind of difficult, but I think um, just reflecting on the past two weeks, and, and initially when we even started telling the story, we we told it from a point of his prominence and her wealth, and the fact that. Even though the the incidents of those two people from such different parts of Belizean society sitting on finding themselves sitting on the same pier that night was weird, and that plays out in what happened subsequently to his shooting death in terms of how she's going to be charged, and we heard it from former Attorney General Michael Perfit when he was on Jules's show this week. Because we asked him, what do you think would have happened if he had shot her? And he goes, oh, he would have been charged for triple murder. <laughs> and that's just the way the cookie crumbles in a society like this. Yeah. And, I, and I, I guess my final point on this that doesn't sit well is that, you know, you often hear about the brotherhood, you know, police officers and the, the blue line and all that. And it just seems like they're very um, willing to just sort of sweep this under the rug as much as possible. That I, I just would have expected a little bit more aggression from the police in investigating the death of, of a high ranking member of their brotherhood. It's interesting because the most aggression that we've seen from them was on that second day in San Pedro, when they set up the memorial to Jamat, the very first one. And, um, what was said by the police officers there was, we're going to have her walk past this memorial so that she sees it so that she sees his face. And later on, that ended up happening in Cayo as well. But that's really the most aggression I've seen from them toward her, because other than that, especially with the way the media was treated in San Pedro, it almost seems that her image was being protected. And it was protected again when she exited the Colby Foundation, allowed to have that towel over her face and all those officers flanking her. A prison guard carrying her suitcase for her. I mean, yeah. And when I say aggression, I'm not talking about any sort of like physical aggression towards her. I'm talking about the aggressiveness of the investigation. I mean, this thing was, according to the commissioner, was, you know, the case closed in like 48 hours, which is remarkably quick, you know. Um, And there are definitely a lot more layers to this then anybody wants to sort of peel away. So, so that, that's what kind of um, I find very remarkable, especially because it was a high-ranking member of the police force who, um, while may not have been universally loved in society, I think was definitely respected within the ranks of the Belize Police Department. So this was one of their brothers. And I just, I don't know, I'm just shocked. I mean, that, that they're not trying harder to to pin a a stronger a higher charge on this or investigate it a little bit further but um in my interview with the prime minister that I did last week when I asked him about this case he says you know as prime minister he's not allowed to get involved he didn't even know when he was deputy prime minister he's not allowed to call the dpp about any case that's not his role but i asked him you know did you get a call from Ashcroft at any point. He's an acquaintance of yours, at least. Have you discussed this case in any matter? And his answer was simply no. And perhaps I should have followed up on that and been like, really, sir? Like, no discussion has happened. But when it comes to the police and how aggressive they've been in the investigation, we have to come back to your original point that the specter of Lord Ashcroft is felt everywhere in this country. And so certainly within the police department, I'm sure there are things that if they are not afraid to do, they will be measured in doing. 
you know, nobody wants to get um, uh, deployed down to Creaky Sarko or, you know, or somewhere, some backwater in Toledo, which is what they like to do with the police officers that, you know, get in the way. So, um, yeah. But anyway, Sharice, uh, we could talk about this uh, all day, but... Um, before we wrap up, let's let's talk about something something positive. I think some some good news, and that's the fact that you've got another project coming up on on at Channel Seven, and and that's that you're going to be producing the a brand new morning show called Sun Up on Seven. So here's your here's your chance to to give us a plug about your new show. All right. So the new show Sun Up on Seven, we wanted to put a different twist on the morning show. And so if you notice from the initial teaser we've put out. It's largely young people that uh, we have hosting the show. Renata Samuels, who is a UNICEF ambassador. Um, Kevin Mendez, who has advocated for all these LGBTQ uh, charities, as well as the AIDS Commission and all these things that he's deeply embroiled with. And then Brandon Usher, who's a young attorney, well-versed in the law, well-connected. And we feel that this team, and we did kind of choose them deliberately to cover all spectrums of what is Belize, geographically and racially, because we think it's important, representation is important, and we want every young kid to be able to see themselves on that stage in these discussions that we're having. And one of the things that they talked to me about last week in our initial meeting is that they really want it to be a platform to create agents of change so that we can talk about stories of what's difficult in this country to highlight that and then to be able to inspire people who want to change these things to come forth and when is the show going to debut it debuts on june 21st god help us <laughs> <laughs> at what time uh at 6 30 6 30 a.m and it'll be how long uh until eight Okay, yeah. fantastic. So it's called Sun Up at 7. You watch for it on June 20, starting June 21st on Channel 7, produced by Sharice Halsell. I know it's going to be fantastic. Sharice, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of the weekend to, to join me here in the podcast. And just want to remind people that if you want to know more about Sharice Halsell and her story, you should check out an episode of the Natasha Stewart podcast from a couple of months ago. I'll leave a link to that show in the description and the notes for this show so you can you can have a listen to it, but uh, Natasha did a full hour with you. Uh, you guys talked about everything, you know, the time that you spent living in Europe, um, you know, how you got into the the media business and, and even your your side hustle as a PR and promoter for the band Ascentium. Uh, it's an excellent episode. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Natasha Stewart podcast. Um, it's it's one of, you know, my regular listens. Uh, she's taking a, a break right now between seasons, but hopefully she's coming back back soon. But, uh, what I love about her podcast is, um, I call it my, my go-to Zen podcast, you know, because, you know, I get on, I get on this show and I rant and it's like, Oh my God, everything's terrible and stuff. And then I listen to Natasha for an hour, just, you know, talk to people like yourself about, you know what, there's some really cool stuff happening in Belize and there's some really great people that are doing great things. And you know, everything's going to be all right. And, and, <laughs> and that's what I love about the vibe that she has with that podcast. It's extremely positive. Um, but, uh, I just love the episode that, that she did with you. Uh, and basically, you know, you give us your whole life story, even as, as a child growing up in Bemel Pan and, and sort of what you went through feeling like an outsider. And, and there was actually surprisingly a lot of your story that I could relate to, even, even though I never grew up here. Uh, I've been in Belize for like, I don't know, 22 years or whatever, but there was so much of what you talked about in, you know, in your childhood experience that I then actually experienced as my, myself as an adult you know, being an outsider and trying to find the, my place where I fit in in Belize. But anyways, not about me. It's about you. It's an excellent episode. It's on the Natasha Stewart podcast. There's a link to it in the description. Please definitely check it out. And if you haven't done so already, anyone who's listening to this, I highly recommend that you subscribe to the Natasha Stewart podcast because every episode she puts out is an absolute Really, gem. really great. Absolute gem. Sharice, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Okay, as always, it's time to big up all the other Belizean podcasters who have put out new content recently. 
Andre Hibet and Digna Ramirez have a brand new episode of Mud of Fire, looking at the importance of forest conservation in Belize. Tyler J. Bermudez from the Real Thai Belize podcast talks about Patrick Faber, Jasmine Harton, and the impact of COVID-19 on high school graduation. And Aria Lightfoot has a great interview with independent politician and community activist Anna Banner Guy on the Two Can View podcast. I'll post links to all these shows in the notes for this episode. Remember, you can be part of the podcast movement in Belize by sharing Brent's two cents with at least one person who otherwise may not know about it. And don't forget to subscribe to all the great Belizean podcasts on your favorite app so you never miss an episode from any of us. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Two Cents Belize. And I would especially love it if you would leave a voice message for the podcast about anything you want to talk about. Hey, I want to give a big thank you to Spencer for continuing to support this podcast by buying me a few more cups of coffee. If you want to join Spencer and all the other amazing listeners like him who help keep this podcast going, you will find a link for Buy Me a Coffee in the description for this episode. A coffee is only three US or six Belize, but it really does help to cover the expenses of producing this labor of love. And that's going to do it for episode 33 of Brent's Two Cents. Until next time, please continue to wear your masks, wash your hands, get vaccinated. But most importantly, be nice to each other. Brent's Two Cents is a presentation of OSHA Productions, Belize's affordable professional video production company.